Hi, you're watching Bread and Roses. Bread and Roses is a weekly political social magazine broadcast on New Channel TV. I'm Mariam Namazi and I'm presenting this week's program with my brilliant co-hosts Bahram Suroush and Faiwars Puya. Hello. This week's program is on the issue of apostasy. As we all know, apostasy is a punishment um, that is prescribed by all major religions. In Islam, under Sharia law, in, in particular, we see that there are 11 countries where apostasy is actually punishable by death, and in other countries like Bangladesh and Pakistan, where they don't have apostasy laws, they kill apostates using blasphemy laws. And places like Iran, Sudan, Saudi Arabia, Afghanistan, they have apostasy laws. And obviously, um, there are religious reasons for it, political reasons as well. I think we should talk about that a bit. I suppose the first question we need to address is, even though apostasy is a fundamental feature of all major religions, prosecuting apostates, why is it that in the 21st century it is only apostates from Islam that can still be killed? Firebors? Um I, I think there are two reasons for this. One is historical. Um, Islamic idea of a closed society and ideology hasn't been challenged historically, and I think that's something that's taken place in Christianity, we've seen that in the uh, 15th and 16th century, that Enlightenment actually challenged the idea of that and the, the right of people to free thinking has been established in Europe. The other factor is rise of the political Islamic movement that actually uses it as a means of suppression. Yeah, I agree with Faribos that uh, historically the major fight that was fought by free thinking people, by uh, civil society was specifically against Christianity uh, in Europe, but that has not happened with uh, uh, Islam. And so that's why we are facing uh, apostasy laws, which are being specifically now because of the political Islamic movement, um, uh, which keeps um, hanging on to it and using it for political ends. So what we are probably what the next step is, and I think we are seeing that in the sense that the people questioning Islam in countries where people are living under Islamic laws, so the next step would be sort of a similar movement as what happened in Europe, uh, an anti-Islamic backlash, a re renaissance in that sense. Well, we are seeing that in places uh, like Iran, aren't we? Absolutely, and I think this is huge. Yeah. It's not sort of um, small movement is huge in Middle East. The only reason you have huge supp suppressive state, you, you know, using all these means to suppress the apostates and free thinkers is because of the importance of this in Iran, in Saudi Arabia. I mean, we've seen that in Pakistan and e even within the communities in Europe, the Islamic communities in, in Europe, we'll see that this is huge. And I think thanks to people who've come out and openly challenged the idea of uh, uh, repressive um, religious ideas of controlling people. I mean, what, what, what's interesting about this issue is that obviously it's not a theoretical issue and what makes it so urgent in a sense, you know. Right now the reason we're having this program and this discussion is the fact that we have a case in the news right now of Maryam Yahya Ebrahim. She's a Sudanese woman and she's um, been charged with both apostasy and adultery. She's in prison with her 20-month-old child and she's eight months pregnant as well. And I read in a recent report that she's been shackled in her cell as well. So what inhuman treatment for the very, for the very reason of wanting to believe what she wants. Exactly, that's how, just how a case in point, be? you know, that, um, that it still lives on. I mean, we were talking in previous programs about the Sultan of Brunei, you know, declaring uh, Sharia laws and stoning and everything. It just shows that there are political interests behind it and they're copying from, say, for example, from Iran, Saudi Arabia, where they have been, it's been practiced. Because once you have sort of those sort of rigid ideologies you know, and you uh, describe it as the word of God, then you can justify anything. And it's a good so, form of suppression, suppressing exactly. people and, and I, 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 I think opposition. you're right. Absolutely. I, I remember in the 1980s, in Iran, in, Iran. Where, in Iran, where the Islamic regime was uh, was challenged by the left-wing groups in in Iran, um, they arrested a lot of people. Thirty seconds 
decision. Are you a Muslim? No. Immediate execution. You know, it's unbelievable, unheard of. Yeah, thousands and of thousands of people, prisoners were political prisoners were executed in that manner. And even if they said, yes, we're Muslim, do you pray? The second or question not? was, do you pray? Do you pray? pray? If no, again, execution. as an apostate, and, yeah. you need exactly. to Exactly, and we should be clear as well that uh, we are talking about people um, who um, had not chosen Islam as a religion voluntarily, it had been assigned to them uh, by birth you know, by their family, because if you were a political prisoner and they said that you, your parents were uh, Muslim, so by definition, according to Islam, you have to be Muslim, and if you don't practice it, then you are an apostate, and you, the uh, punishment is death. Why don't we go and uh, look at an interview we did earlier with uh, Nahla Mahmoud. Nahla Mahmoud is a Sudanese secularist. She's co-spokesperson of uh, the Council of Ex-Muslims of Britain. Let's talk to her both about Maryam Yahya Ibrahim's case in Sudan, as well as the issue of apostasy, and then we'll come back and discuss a little bit more. Stay with us. I wanted to ask you about this horrible case we've heard recently of Maryam um, Yahya Ibrahim, who is facing execution in Sudan for apostasy and adultery. Can you explain her case? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so Maryam is a Sudanese Christian woman uh, who's been charged with apostasy and adultery, um, which are punishable by death and flogging in her case, um, according to the Islamic Sharia laws in Sudan. Um, she's in prison, heavily pregnant, with her other son as well. And um, she'll be given a chance to repent, which is um, claiming guilt and uh, converting back to Islam. If she insists on her beliefs, then she, she, she will be hanged to death. Um, there are different, different um, sources that provide different details. So some, some would say that she, she's been born into a Muslim family and then converted. Some would say that she, she's originally a Christian. Um, there are also details, different information about her family's background and her own circumstances. Um, but uh, what I actually think is that, you know, all this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if she's Muslim or Christian or um, an atheist. What matters is that she, she has absolutely the right to believe in whatever she wishes to believe in and uh, express this belief openly, freely and safely without, you know, fearing to be harassed or attacked or even worse, um, you know, waiting in prison um, for a punishment. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, it's, it's no one's job. It's no one's job to guard people's moral morals and, and private beliefs. Um, and maybe that's a, another good reminder why we need to separate religion from the state and, you know, adopt secular secular laws. I guess uh, for, for you in particular it must be something that's really close to your heart because you yourself are an apostate and yeah. you left Islam. Um, tell us why you did that. So I guess again my story wouldn't be you know a very unique story. It's a, it's a typical story of many ex-Muslims. Um, you start questioning things around that you don't get answers for um, and it mainly starts with, with school so you, you go to school you you're not allowed to ask about certain things um, critical thinking is not is not encouraged there's no evolution um, you actually get the the harsh reality and the real hit when you become a woman um, and that's a woman at yeah what, that's what, a, what age is that honestly it's quite funny because yeah. it, it, it could be you know from just once you get your puberty yeah which could be from nine yeah. upward you're yeah. still a child um, and you get all these uh, inequalities uh, in rights, you get less rights, you're being dealt with as half, you need a, a guard and the lots of inequalities and unfair um, treatments, especially within the family matters. Um, and then that also continues until you get to, you know, it continues to the, to the work um, environment and the public sphere. So all these together just, you know, got me to think that it, this is unjust, it's unfair and I don't need mythologists to live a meaningful and joyful life. Um, so I, I renounced it as a as a belief system and a guidance um, to my life, and uh, as a very strongly opposed it as a you know an ideology in in power. Um, I um, I also guess it's time now that we we stop seeing ex-Muslims and apostates as um, 
you know, as breaking news. Uh, these are people who, who, who live between and among us. They're, they're apostates and Muslims in every, in ex-Muslims. Um, and including, it, it also includes liberal and progressive Muslims as well. I guess the case of um, Mohammed Muhammad Taha, Sunni theologian who been hanged to death for his progressive Islamic thoughts is also um, another case. So all these needs to, we need to stop looking at ex-Muslims as, you know, a group of isolated people living somewhere we're going to threaten the normal, normal community. Um, there's always, there's always, always more than, um, there's always diversity, whatever there's more than one person Definitely, thinking. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's interesting because, um, you know, you could be Maryam in a way, yeah. and she has the same name as I do. I mean, the thing is that uh, if you were not living in, if you were in Sudan right now, you could be in her very situation. Yeah, exactly. And even though you live in, abroad now you're you're living in Britain you have faced threats as a result haven't yeah. you yeah Let's that's explain true. that yeah that's true so um I, I had faced before um some some consequences for renouncing Islam in, in Sudan um mainly because I, I wasn't able to air it properly and was forced to do lots of um I was forced to follow lots of Islamic traditions but I guess the the main consequence was here in the UK, which might be surprising for some. It was after Channel 4 interview I did, um, criticizing the Sharia courts here in the UK. And um, I received death threats, I had to move places. I, uh, um, um, my family back in Sudan have been very badly harassed. And there was, there was um, a takfir campaign, which is sort of, uh, you know, um, inciting hate style campaign organized by one of the Lib Dem members who was until recently a councillor. Um, um, so yeah, all this, I guess, the, 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 mo the most disappointing and maybe worrying um, part of it is that the authorities didn't take it seriously. So the police blamed me for all the consequences and said I shouldn't have said what I said in the first place. The Lib Dems, um, whom I approached along with many other supporters, um, also uh, were just very defendant and kept responding and saying um, this is sort of a misunderstanding, whatever that means. And when you look at my case, along with many other reported cases, so you get the case of Tom Hollands, who've been threatened as well because of his documentary untold story about Islam, the recent Majid Nawaz tweet uh, about Jesus and Mo, the T-shirts, um, Jesus and Mo T-shirt, uh, where the two, two LSE senior students were forced to cover it or be physically removed out of, uh, out of a student fair. So you look at all this together, and you can you can you can sense a trend, an aggressive trend toward those who criticize, renounce, or challenge even, um, you know, aspects in Islam or certain aspects within within Islam. Um, and I guess if there's one thing we should learn from that is that we need to challenge individuals and groups who threaten um, the freedom of expression of um, everyone else, and very strongly. I, know, mean, I mean, it's interesting because, uh, as you say, it's uh, very often you you um, are faced with this outlook that everybody thinks the same and it's not the case as you mentioned yes. and I know I lived in Sudan for two years I know there are many seculars and free thinkers who live there what are some of the things that people here can do to support seculars in Sudan in, in Iran in the Middle East and North Africa yeah uh, well uh, there are actually a couple of things so the first thing is to challenge um, do write to your MPs, write to the local councillors and ask them to challenge the government in dealing with the Sudanese authorities and any other authority that adopt um, apostasy laws or Sharia laws. Um, and it's, again, yeah, as you said, it's not Mariam's case, it's the challenging the whole ideology. So that's one. Um, there's, uh, you can also uh, challenge individuals and, and groups who threaten, use, um, use religion to threaten others and, and silence them. Um, and I guess there's, there's lots, we need to hold people accountable and responsible for what they do and say, so that's an important thing. And there are lots of debates going on now in the UK, so there, we can challenge the Sharia courts that, that exist and we can take part in, in lots of the debates that's going on, the segregate, gender segregation, the um, niqab, the halami, the faith schools, lots of these uh, issues could be, you know, could be influenced just by writing a piece, you know, leaving a comment, sharing your thoughts in, in different social media platforms. The other thing is to support. So we could support people on ground by either promoting the work they're doing or by, um, you know, supporting them financially. And if for the for Sudan, for example, they're they're not 
a secular body as such, um, or a certain institution that defends freedom of expression specifically, uh, obviously because of the same oppressive laws, but there are lots of groups that you know um, fight for equal rights and freedoms and change. Uh, to name a few, there's Taghir al-An, there's Grifna, um, the Shawari who works through art, the lots of enlightenment centers that we could also support, Khatim Adlan, um, Abdel Karim Margani. So these could be supported by promoting the work they're doing or by supporting them financially. And what about, oh, sorry, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, the last thing, the yeah. last thing is to support organizations that, that work toward um, you know, defending and protecting uh, these sort of freedoms, mm. equal rights and, and freedoms to express and believe. Um, and also here in the UK, we, we've got quite many of them. Council of Ex-Muslims, One Law for All, National Secular Society, um, internationally there's women, secularism is a women's issue. There are lots right. of other organizations right. that could be supported. And one final question, because we we're running out of time, is how can we specifically help Maryam's case? How can we stop her from being executed? Pressure. There's, there's no way we can stop pressure. We need to put more pressure so we can put pressure on authorities, we can put pressure on, on the UK authorities to put pressure on them. Mm. And pressure does work. I mean yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Cause you, you know, you, you, you challenge these people in public, you embarrass them in public and um, yeah, you just isolate them in a way. Yeah. Um, with so all the pressure. so, let's, so we let's work to towards pressure. stopping her execution. Yeah, campaigns, whatever, whoever can write something, you know, um, Sign a petition. Sign, exactly, sign a petition, share on Facebook, yeah. tweet. Yeah. Um, anything. Yeah, anything yeah. you can do will okay. would usually help. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Nahla Mahmoud. I think, you know, Nahla touched on a really important issue, which is the fact that, you know, the case of Maryam Yahya Ibrahim is not a rare case. It's a very common case, you know. I mean, Mariam has my name, uh, Nahla has, uh, is, comes from the Sudan and she might have faced uh, these very sentences had she stayed there, as would any of us, you know. And in that sense, the fact that, you know, this, the, these charges by Islamic states and movements is affecting so many people. One major way of doing that are these apostasy laws. And you see, part of the function of having such laws is not um, what you hear about these graphic cases, a lot of it is a lot. Of, a lot of it is underneath, because the laws make a lot of people not to um, act on what they want to do as a free human being. If they want to leave um, Islam, if they want to, if they want to commit to another religion or become atheists, or carry on to live like uh, any other human being, you know. Uh, as an independent individual, they can't do that. So a lot of victimization that is going on, that is, we don't hear it on the news. So the only these are the sort of tip of the ice, uh, iceberg. Yeah, and, and I think heresy is very important. Uh, apostasy is very important because you start questioning the given uh, facts and you go beyond that. You know, we said in the last program that human beings are they have you know, different ideas and you know, to put every, everybody in a box is, is impossible. You only have to suppress society. But it's important. If it's, uh, society wants to uh, be free, wants to progress, it wants to advance, it needs to, you know, people need to experience the ideas, test ideas, think about it, out of the box, in the box, in different format. And the, uh, the apostasy law actually controls. Yeah, I mean, in a, in it a controls sense. everybody and I think that's really negative for society, the whole of society is you know, negative. I mean, when you look at it, there are obviously religious justifications for it. You have Islamic scholars, members of the Islamic regime of Iran, for example, saying the fact that if they didn't have these sort of apostasy laws, people wouldn't believe in Islam anymore. They wouldn't be able to control people anymore. And in a sense, you know, it is a way of controlling people. It is a way of stopping them from, from, from keeping their own control, really. And you see in societies like in Britain, even though, you know, the church still has a role to play, the less of a role the church has, the less religious people are. And they do lose control as a result, and, and it does concern and worry them. But I agree that fundamentally it's a political form of control because it's a way of keeping political power. And, and, and that's why you often yeah. see that they're charging people with apostasy who haven't even really committed 
the crime of leaving yeah. religion. It's it, it, for basic things. In a lot of cases, uh, these are used as uh, the charges, the official charges. You see, the question is, who are they to this, um, prescribe for people uh, how they, what they should believe in? You see, the first thing they do is describe the whole population as Muslim, as they do in Iran. They say that you are by definition, because they have come to power, so everybody's supposed to be Muslim. And like them, Muslim exactly. like them. Yeah. So, and then, that's the starting point. And then from that, they move on to control you and say that you have to follow all these um, um, uh, Islamic laws and Sharia laws. And if you don't... We'll kill you. We'll kill you. And, you know, all, all sorts of other hideous punishments that they have. And I agree that in the last 30, 40 years, the Islamic political movement it's had a major influence in the spread of apostasy law. But at the same time, I think this apostasy um, law functions within communities. So it's a social relation, social power, which ultimately ends in political power. But there are, where they, uh, within societies, for example, in, um, in Britain, that we have communities which are dominated by um, Islamic ideas, and you could see the hierarchy and, and, and political, not political, the social power division that is a means of older men, you know, who are very reactionary, they want to keep the position within the community, they use that as, as, as a means of controlling that community and population. Yeah, I mean, I think people like, for example, watching this program in Iran will be surprised maybe to learn how many ex-Muslims or apostates live in Britain, who are born and raised in Britain, who are afraid to say that they're atheists now, who continue to go to mosque, who continue to wear the hijab, but they're actually atheists, you know. And it just shows what sort of power this movement has, but also what sort of opposition it has. I mean, exactly. we can't forget that opposition. And I think that was the idea with the, um, uh, the idea of the uh, ex-Muslim, you know, the council, uh, yeah. the council of ex-Muslim. Yeah. And it showed the, how many people really, the, the, uh, the way people welcomed it, and they came out in a sense, and showed that there are thousands of people who feel the same, and that's why that idea was very important. That was like a trigger, because a lot of people said, that's very provocative, why are you doing this? You know, you'll hurt other people, you're, you're very confrontational. But the thing is, in such a serious case, you have to be confrontational, you have to be provocative, so that people will dare come out and say, that's it. I want to be like everybody else, you know, like you guys who have said no to religion. Yeah, but isn't it interesting that they say that we can be killed and that's their right to religion and we're provocative when we say you can't yeah, kill us is not and we have a right to say we're atheists. Yeah. I mean, it's just... We, we provoke, they kill. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you don't provoke, they won't kill. Really? I don't think so. Well, it's interesting. For example, in Iran, which um, the Islamic um, control an apostasy law is imposed through state, the opposition to um, um, Islamic ideology expresses in, instead politically. So you have a, you know, a huge uh, population of women who fight against Chador, for example, that's effectively questioning the fundamental tenets of Islam. Or um, uh, you know, the whole movement against revenge and executions in Iran that is currently taking place. Um, uh, you know, that, these are actually effectively social movements against those ideology and the background and social backbone of apostasy which is huge in the Middle East and I think in Iran uh, the population is leading this change. That's a, the anti-Islamic backlash yeah, has definitely. started already yeah. and, and it's fantastic. Yeah. I know. mean this is something that's bubbling from below and it's, it is, it's like you just remove the pressure cooker and the world will see this enlight explosive enlightenment coming from the Middle East, particularly I think Iran especially. But doesn't it make you crazy to hear people who are on the left, and I'm on the left myself, we are, um, defending Islamism as people's right to religion, making excuses for Islamism, when there are people on the front lines battling it day in and day out? That's a sort of, uh, I don't know what to call it, but pro-Islamic left yeah. or the post-modernist. Mm -hmm. They feel that they are being very culturally sensitive by doing that. They, bunch everybody together and they said they are from a third world country that that religion sh should needs to be supported somehow that we shouldn't interfere it would be too you know, imperialistic if we uh, interfered in that but the question is the 
what are we left for? We are left because we want to defend universal rights of the people. As we defend, for example, workers' right to go on a strike, to have a trade union or whatever, we should defend everyone's right, women's equality. So if there is an ideology which is against that, that is genuine, to be a genuine left is to oppose that. And that is not what's being opposed. I just want to mention also the Egypt. In Egypt, it was fantastic that when Morsi came to power, millions of people came out and they uh, ousted them. You know, I, I know what's happened after that. Yeah. You know, it's still yeah. society in turmoil, but it shows in the whole of Middle East. There's such there's a this hatred of Islamism. Absolutely. And I think, I mean, it, it's true. You know, something we always say that you're not going to find any greater opposition against Islamism, against apostasy laws, than actually people who have to live under it. Because it does, as you it's say, a, it's a limit issue. basic freedom of expression. Yeah. It limits the right to just think. Think. You can't even think as you like. Yeah, I think, I think in, in those countries is a practical issue. It's a mass, means of, matter of survival, actually, to be able to breathe and question. So it becomes. But it's important to give a clear voice to this opposition, so hence the Council of Ex-Muslim and atheist, uh, you know, Iranian, you know, Saudi Arabian, uh, Pakistani, Egyptian, Iraqi, Middle Eastern atheists and ex-Muslim have such a cru crucial role to play to openly challenge Islamic ideology and fight for the right to question uh, such ideology. And that challenge is very clear. I mean, just recently I heard in the news on in June there's going to be a 15-year-old boy in Arbil, Iraqi Kurdistan, who is being charged with atheism and criticizing religion. He was turned in by his father. There are so many people, young people, old, like him, and like Maryam, and we really need to support Absolutely. them. And I think a very important point that uh, to bear in mind is that the millions of people, and as you mentioned, the millions of people living under those uh, laws, they are against it, you know. And people uh, say in, in Europe should have no, no doubt, you know, it is not that those people have acquiesced, have accepted. It has been forced on them by, um, uh, you know, by uh, tyranny, by dictatorship, by, um, by imprisoning them, putting them to jail, you know, yeah, by so that. It's been forced on them. What is the excuse of the pathetic excuse of a left that lives in, the, in Britain, lives in the West, and defends them vis-a-vis -vis all these resisting people? I've been on the losing side. They are on the losing Clearly. side. You're Clearly losing you could badly. See, <laughs> you could see that they, they have no argument. The only um, argument they have, they're just anti-American and anti-imperialism. And that's, you know, that's, that's, that's not human, a justification. Human. That's not a good justification. Last quick, quick question. We got a tweet asking us, is there any way for hadiths that mandate punishment for apostasy to be taken less seriously or even altered? Less seriously by whom? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> now, and and but, I, think, I, think it's a I think this is a serious question in a way, because there, is a, there are a lot of people who actually say you need to change Islam, you need to work within it, reform it. Um, from experience, what we've seen in Iran, and I think if you look at the experience of 16th, 17th century, when you challenge them head on, then they are forced to retreat. You can't actually start reforming an ideology which is very close. You and need to challenge yeah. it and we can... And which is empowered. Then they start, yeah. I would say if there's a choice between uh, people's rights mm -hmm. and their religion, I would always choose rights, you know. And if they clash, that's the problem of the religious people and, and those religions. And I think we should know on which side we are, on the rights on side of the rights of the people. So those religions, if they want to reform it, that's up to them. As long as they keep that, their hands off the ch uh, of children, they keep their hands off you know, uh, women's rights, of free thinking, and uh, everything else that we believe are fundamental rights of everyone. Brilliant. Let's end with that um, brilliant statement by Bahram. If we have to choose between a religion and, or rights, we'll take rights any day. I hope you enjoyed this week's program. Don't forget to consider this program yours. Send us your comments, send us your ideas for us to discuss. We are looking forward to hearing from you as always. I want to remind you that we are fundraising for a video mixer, a computer and uh, some other necessities, hugely necessary for our director Reza Moradi and assistant director Pune Ravi. So give us your support if you can, even one pound will help. I hope 
again that you enjoyed this program. Until next week, I'll say goodbye on our behalf.